Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. It's a true pleasure to be back in my home country, in fact, in my home city, and to partake and be immersed in the culture and the gastronomy that was mentioned earlier. So I thank uh, Dean Iniguez for this opportunity to address you. Uh, I may be the only person in the room that doesn't have or is soon to have an MBA, and it may not be obvious that there's a connection between MBA and the world of space, but there is, which you'll hear as I get to my remarks in a little bit. So my intent today is to just tell you a little bit, a very brief amount of the past, present, and the future of human spaceflight. Talk a little bit about how I got involved in it, uh, was lucky enough to participate, and then um, I, I will try to tie the end, at the end how this world of business has a lot to do with space, um, which is a relatively new de development. Before I start, <clears throat> if you've been to space, raise your hand so I can get a head count here. <laughs> Nobody. So that's interesting, uh, probably not surprising, but toward the end of my talk, I will uh, give you some inspiration not only if you want to go to space, but if you want to be involved in space in any of a number of capacities. So, the past for us started back in 1961. In fact, um, April 12th, 1961 was when Yuri Gagarin launched into space. Um, for me, it started in 1969. This image was taken by Neil Armstrong of his uh, crewmate Buzz Aldrin on the moon. I was 11 years old. When it happened, not long before this photo was taken, I was at the beach with my family. Uh, we were frolicking in the waves, and the adults started asking the kids to leave the beach or leave the water and, and come up. And we thought, was there a problem? You know, was, was there, are there sharks? What's going on? Well, it turns out they were all listening to transistor radios, and this was when they made the final approach and landing to the moon. And Neil Armstrong said his famous words about one small step and one giant leap. And my recollection was that uh, people, adults who didn't really even know each other, were sort of slapping each other on the back and congratulating each other. It was a real moment of inspiration for me. So I, um, I had already actually been interested in space. Um, my best friend and I used to go to orbit pretty often in my closet. I had all the instruments um, painted on the inside of my closet door, which my mother was very happy about. Um, that was a phase. I was, um, as I said, a young boy, and I also wanted to be a football player, a fireman, an architect. I went to Mission Viejo High School, and being an astronaut was really not at the top of my list. As Amber mentioned, I'm not one of those of my colleagues who had this dream. You said three years old. I think some of them had it at conception. Um, for me, it was quite a bit later. Um, I went to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, um, again, thinking at that time about architecture. This is yet the second sort of deviation from this path to becoming an astronaut that I didn't even know I was on. Um, these guys don't make architects, they make naval officers. And I took the oath of office in July of 1976, and four years later, uh, we threw our hats up in the air and we graduated. So at the Naval Academy, you have four options. You can be a surface warfare officer, a nuclear submariner, a United States Marine, or an aviator. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but as I began to spend some time with people from those communities, I realized that I was, my personality matched the, the out of aviation a lot more. So I decided I would go in aviation. These are the uh, Navy flight demonstration team, the Blue Angels flying F-18s. That would have been a pretty good path to become an astronaut, but I chose a different path. I flew the EP-3. Uh, as you notice, it's not quite as glamorous. Uh, very important mission, not terribly exciting for a pilot, but I made it for reasons that were not related to aviation, but were re related to lifestyle, because I was able to be stationed here in Spain and have a glass of wine with my meal every night instead of living on board an aircraft carrier with 5,000 guys. Then about this time, I read an article in a magazine, the Naval Aviation News, about becoming a test pilot at the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. So um, test pilots combine aviation with engineering. Those are both things I'd studied engineering at the Naval Academy. I thought that would be pretty interesting. And um, there was a sidebar in this article that talked about the graduates who had gone on to become astronauts. And that's when it all clicked for me. That 11-year-old dream, or dream that I had had as an 11-year-old, started to become a possibility, and I thought, 
hey, if I get on this path now, maybe I can become an astronaut. And after going through graduate school, becoming a test pilot, being a um, program manager for a while, I was selected to join the class of 1992, along with um, 18 other folks. We had medical doctors, we had a commercial diver, we had scientists, we had engineers, um, and we had some uh, foreign members join too, a couple Canadians, an Italian, a French, and a Japanese. So we embarked on uh, what they call astronaut candidate training or ASCAN training, which takes about a year, after which you're assignable to a space flight. So whereas the moon was my destination when I, or so I thought, when I was 11 years old, um, back in that day, in the 90s, we weren't going to the moon anymore. We were going around this planet, which you might recognize. So the moon is at about 250,000 miles, 400,000 kilometers distance. Low Earth orbit, which is where we were going at the time and where we still are, is at about 250 miles or 400 kilometers. So if you look at this picture, if you can imagine a vehicle being in orbit around it, it would just be off the surface. Barely, if the diameter of the Earth is about 6,000 kilometers, compare about 350 to that. So you'd see we'd be pretty close. So a lot of people think that in space there's no gravity. Well, it turns out there's just about as much gravity when you're that far off the planet as there is here. So how do we stay in space? We have to go very fast. And in fact, if you look at this time-lapse picture, a rocket launch looks like it's going up, but not long afterward, it actually bends over. And the majority of the ascent stage is when you're trying to get speed so you can actually stay in orbit. And at the time, the way we did that was with this vehicle, the space shuttle. Space shuttle is one of, it is not one of, it is the most sophisticated flying machine ever conceived or built. Unbelievable project that was designed, started to be designed in the 60s and 70s, put together in the 70s, flew its first flight in 1981. It has uh, several components, the solid white, solid, the white solid rocket boosters on either side, the big external tank in the middle which holds liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen uh, which fuel the three main engines of the shuttle and then the orbiter itself which is reusable. The cockpit uh, looks complicated. It's actually fairly primitive. When you think about the computational power in this vehicle, everybody that's got a smartphone in here has multiple times that. 512 kilobytes of memory in the computers on this thing. But it could do amazing things. A few days before launch, it's rolled out to the pad on top of its mobile launch platform. And a few hours before launch, the crew walks out uh, from their quarantine into this van that takes them uh, the seven or so miles to the pad. So uh, that's a pretty exciting time, as you can imagine. We spend uh, about a year training for a shuttle flight. We get to know each other very well. Um, it's an exciting, but you, you, I, you would think that it's scary. I'll tell you the things that when we stop in this van on the way to the uh, launch pad, and the chief of the astronaut office says, would I like now, you now to join me in the astronaut prayer. We all bow our heads and we say, please God, don't let us screw up. <laughs> so the launch um, is, uh, there's a lot of vibration, there's a lot of G's, uh, and, and the G's increase as the vehicle gets lighter. Um, we're burning a lot of propellant. In fact, I think rather than tell you about it, I think I'll just show you some uh, a video. So let's do that now, please. So you, you saw the roll to the uh, inclination plane, you saw a little bit of vibration. The solid rocket booster ride is very rough. After they come off two minutes into the launch, the ride gets a lot smoother. Then we're just on the three main engines and external tank. A total of eight and a half minutes to get from zero to 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's the speed we need to stay 
in orbit. The SRBs are jettisoned, they land back in the water, they're also recuperated uh, and, and reused, and then of course the shuttle continues to orbit, gets rid of the external tank, which burns up in the atmosphere, and we continue on our two-week mission. Now what do we do? A variety of things. Uh, we deployed satellites, in some cases we retrieved satellites, uh, but the most important thing was we built the International Space Station, which is the present part of space travel. So if the space shuttle was the most um, complicated flying machine ever built, this is absolutely the most complicated engineering project ever undertaken in the world. Uh, 17 countries from five different space agencies have put this thing together over the last 10 or 15 years. You can see the pieces here. And basically the way this construction is, these modules are built in different countries using different languages, sometimes different measurement systems and different alphabets and they're launched in different vehicles and they are brought together in space and they actually fit, which is amazing. So the way it would happen is a, an element would be launched in the shuttle's payload bay and then a robotic arm is taken, is used to retrieve uh, one of the elements, sometimes handed off to the space station's robotic arm and then the astronauts would often go out and do some extravehicular activities, also called spacewalks, to connect the modules connect the fluid lines, connect the cables, basically do construction work in space. So this video kind of shows the um, assembly sequence. All of the modules that you see came up on either a Russian um, vehicle or a, the space shuttle most often. So the first two came together back in 1998 and then every one of these, you can see the dates in the lower left-hand corner, represents a mission that was launched either from Kennedy Space Center in Florida for, or from uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And each of these pieces represents one of those flights, usually uh, one or two of these spacewalks with the astronauts getting involved. You see some re reconfiguration going on. The space station is on orbit right now. It has six people aboard. It's had people aboard since 2000. It's been continuously manned. The average stay on board is, is for about uh, six months. My mission happened to be seven months. I was fortunate enough to be in command of it. At that time, there were only three people aboard. This is 2006 to 2007. But now we do amazing amount of research up there. There are five different laboratory facilities, and the whole idea is to be able to conduct research that is on the cutting edge of what we can do, both from the, res the fundamental research side, but also advancing technology to make uh, life better, not just for people in space, but also for people um, on the ground through medicine, advances in medicine. And while I was talking all that, the International Space Station was almost completed. <clears throat> so that's all very interesting and very, um, well, I don't want to by any means um, dismiss it, the importance of these events, but what's important to you guys is maybe a little bit different. So these were all programs that were fundamentally designed, conceived, and paid for by nation states. Why? Because getting into space is really hard and it's really expensive. And until recently, nobody's had the ability to do that except countries. Well, that's changed. It started probably back in 2004. There was an event called the Ansari X Prize, you may know that Charles Lindbergh won a prize when he crossed the Atlantic in 1927. Well, a similar prize was offered in 2004 to a team who could fly to the edge of space, which is accepted to be at 100 kilometers, twice in the span of uh, 10 days or two weeks with three people and return safely. So um, a gentleman named Bert Rutan and a company called Scaled Composites built a vehicle called Spaceship One, which actually won that prize back in 2004. I mean, that wasn't the actual uh, beginning, but that was a seminal moment and is what has become the, the revolution of commercial spaceflight. So whereas this was the domain exclusively of countries, now it's the domain of companies. And the reason is that, so we've been flying airplanes for over 100 years, we've been going to low Earth orbit for 50 years, the technology has matured to the point where it is now accessible by companies, not just by countries. And so the design techniques that are available on, on uh, devices or on um, <clears throat> programs like CAD and the manufacturing techniques, whether it be additive 
manufacturing with 3D printing or otherwise, have allowed players who up until now were, could only dream about going to space to actually make companies to do that. And these people are not just engineers and technicians, they're also business people. So this is where you come in. So I just want to talk about a few of the companies and what they're doing. This is a Maston Aerospace. This is an unmanned vehicle that does um, software development testing for entry, descent, and landing. These are technologies that are needed to go for vehicles, either robotic or human, that will go to Mars one day. This is a company called Worldview <clears throat> that wants to take people in that um, vehicle under a very high altitude balloon. Now, it won't go to space, but it'll go very high to the, on the order of 25 kilometers or so. And from there, you'll be able to appreciate the curvature of the Earth and see some of the sights that we've seen uh, from on orbit for a relatively modest price. So this is one of the entries in, in so-called space tourism, or in this case, near space tourism. This is a Spanish company, Zero to Infinity, based near Barcelona. They also want to take tourists to the edge of space and uh, under balloons. But with this vehicle, they want the, uh, the balloon to be let go, and then this thing would light and take small satellites to low Earth orbit. The small satellite market right now is absolutely off the charts. People, the, the price to get a, a piece of payload to orbit is somewhere bet, uh, around $20,000 per pound. Extremely expensive. There are many companies that are trying to reduce that price by having multiple vehicles, small payloads, economies of scale, etc. And Zero to Infinity is one of them. Speaking of um, Spaceship One, this is its successor, SpaceH2, Spaceship Two, which Richard Branson um, took on board as part of his Virgin Galactic uh, campaign. And they are in the middle of a powered flight tests now where they want to take people again to about 100 kilometers, six people in the back, two pilots up front. Not only do you see the curvature of the Earth, but you get to float in zero G or microgravity for a little while and come back down in a glider. Again, um, not cheap, but accessible to a lot of people and has a very reasonable business case that can close. There's another entrant in this market called XCOR Aerospace that pretends to do the same thing, but with only um, one, one passenger per time, more like a pilot experience. And then there are two companies that are actually sending cargo to the International Space Station in vehicles that they built. This is a spaceship's Dragon capsule, which can rendezvous with and station keep the international, with the International Space Station and then be grappled by the station's robotic arm, berthed, the contents um, emptied, filled up with trash or um, samples, comes back down to Earth recoverable, and we can, we can um, use the science return that's been included in this, which is a really great innovation. Second company doing the same thing as Orbital Science is now Orbital ATK with this Cygnus spacecraft, which you see grappled by the robotic arm. And then finally, the holy grail of these companies is to try to get people to the International Space Station not with the space shuttle, which was, again, a government program with government funding, government oversight, government project management. This is all done by a company, and then the idea is that NASA would buy the service from them. So they have their own uh, decision process, their own manufacturing process, their own test program, their own business people making the contracts with other companies and with NASA, and they want to be able to take um, NASA astronauts and maybe one day paying customers, whether for tourism, or science research and development uh, experimentation aboard the space station, or perhaps one day aboard a commercial space station. So my message to you is that space um, is not necessarily the first thing that an MBA might think of, but I can tell you that not only the idea of be putting together um, business plans and more financing and the more conventional methods, but what I've heard a lot being said about today, innovation, entrepreneurship, and thinking outside the box, this may be a very good um, place for you all. So I'd like to finish with a quick video about the commercial space age.
space effort itself, while still in its infancy, has already created a great number of new companies and tens of thousands of new jobs. Space and related industries are generating new demands, investment, and skilled personnel.